for joining us this evening for this webinar. So in May 2021, the New Zealand Grasslands Association convened the Resilient Pastures Symposium at Lake Karapiro. We had over 200 people from all parts of the New Zealand grassland community attending the symposium. Uh, there were two days of paper presentation and a lot of discussion and debate about the state of our pasture resource in New Zealand. So why was this symposium convened? Well, um, in 2011, the, the Grasslands Association also convened the Pasture Persistence Symposium. Um, and this was in response to emerging concerns that uh, in many cases in the Upper North Island, we were seeing, farmers were seeing pastures newly sown that were failing within two to three years. Um, and that we didn't really have a good handle on the causes of that pasture failure. We knew there were several factors involved. Um, and we certainly didn't have solutions and we were struggling for clear and consistent messages for farmers about how to deal with that problem. Now, 10 years on, um, it's clear that the pasture persistence problem is not solved. Uh, in fact, um, in some cases, it may actually be getting um, even worse. It may be spreading geographically. In the meantime, uh, what we have seen is uh, several other significant trends starting to strengthen. More frequent and severe droughts, um, aligning more closely with climate change projections for 2030 uh, rather than 2020, so almost uh, a decade ahead of where we might have expected to be. Uh, we're also seeing the introduction of a lot of environmental regulation, and that's impacting directly on aspects of pasture management. So, for example, traditional tools like use of nitrogen fertilizer and wintering off um, are, uh, are coming under pressure. And thirdly, we have now got pretty clear evidence from on-farm data for the dairy sector anyway, that since 2005 or thereabouts, pasture production on New Zealand dairy farms has been at best static, in some cases actually declining. Um, and that applies to our top 25% farms that's across the sector. It's not, uh, you know, it's not just seen in the average farm statistics, we're seeing it in the, the top 25% of farms as well. So when it came to uh, planning for a, uh, a follow-up symposium, if you like, from the Pasture Persistence Symposium in 2011, it was clear a broader scope was needed. There were more challenges confronting uh, our pasture-based livestock farmers, and hence the focus then became one of, well, what is the true resilience of our pasture base in New Zealand? True resilience in relation to multiple challenges that are now confronting uh, our grasslands farmers. And hence the title of the symposium um, of Resilient Pastures and the focus on many aspects of true resilience, both physical, financial, and social. So um, there are many implications of those trends, uh, you know, those challenges, trends and those challenges that we're seeing. And they're quite clear and obvious. They impact on productivity, they impact on management complexity, they impact on costs, they impact on stress levels that farmers and their families and employees are encountering. Um, they have implications potentially for the competitiveness of our meat and dairy products in international markets. And there are down the track implications for land use change. And we're seeing that already with shift of pasture-based livestock industries, uh, farming businesses into forestry, for example. Now, most of those implications, in fact, all of them really uh, came under discussion at the symposiums. A lot of talk about where this is all heading. There are also some key messages that came out of the symposium. And so just to reel off four of them, the first was from the farmers particularly, that, and, and particularly those in the north, their message very clearly was that climate, climate change is impacting on their farm businesses now. It's here, it's serious. It's not something that's coming in the future. We've got it now. The second clear message was that you know, all the delegates recognised that the science and innovation system that underpins our, our, our pasture-based livestock industries uh, has been significantly eroded over the last several decades to the point where now we have um, quite a quite a, uh, a small um, capability, numbers of people, and also the expertise and experience of those people to help support future development of our um, of our livestock sectors as these challenges start to hit home. A third message, again from the farmers, was that they feel distanced um, from the science and innovation sector. 
Um, they feel that they can't influence the direction our research and development is taking. And they feel somewhat frustrated that they, that they are seen as passive end users of technologies that others might develop that may not work for them. They want to be more involved in the development of solutions. And that's gold as far as this country is concerned because um, farmers have a huge amount to offer in terms of finding viable, adoptable, practical solutions. And the fourth message that came out was that, well, look, we're not necessarily alone here. I mean, there are other examples that we can draw from overseas and in New Zealand uh, where solutions have been developed and particularly where collaborative approaches to doing that uh, solution development have, have been implemented. Uh, communities, experts, if you like, uh, farmers uh, working together to find the best uh, solutions to the problems that they're confronting. So the organising committee for the Resilient Pastures Symposium undertook to pull together the, the key messages uh, that came from the symposium in 2021. So we've done that and, uh, and that is now published on the um, New Zealand Grasslands Association website uh, as essentially a position paper. Um, and that's, in that position paper, we have attempted to document the major findings with regard to the state of play with New Zealand pasture base and to make that known uh, to interested parties and particularly, um, for example, government departments. So uh, where it goes from here, the content of the, the position paper, the Greener Pastures paper, depends a lot on how we all uh, work towards um, building awareness, how we work towards exerting influence, how we work towards collaboration, cooperation, towards finding solutions. And, you know, the ways in which we can unlock other sources of financial and other support to help drive on-farm change to meet these challenges ahead of us. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. All right, I'll just... There we go, we should be back. Just checking my microphones on. So I would normally say thank you, David, but obviously David's not with us. But um, just a reminder, I'll take that opportunity that you can ask questions if you wish, and we'll put them to our other speakers. Obviously, we can't put them to Mr. Chapman. You can put them in the, in the chat function. We've left that open and public tonight. You can, uh, if you know your way around Zoom, send a private question to, to one of the speakers. Otherwise, it's public, And uh, but we trust you all, and you can all see each other's chats, and please, no arguments or fights in the chat. But we'll keep moving again to, just to make sure we stick to our time. Let's move on to our first in-person presenter, who again, I think won't be a stranger to most of you, uh, Graham Kerr of Baron Bragg Seeds. Uh, welcome, Graham. Um, you're going to cover part one, the value of pastures, but um, let's mix it up a bit and throw you, put you on the spot. What is a resilient pasture? David covered a, a fair bit of it there, but um, you were going to, you can give us a bit of a summary. Um, thanks, Aaron. Um, going off course immediately, um, as you do. Um, I guess uh, there's a lot of talk about what's a resilient pasture, and, and there's no simple answer. Um, I guess historically, a resilient pasture is one that gives good animal productivity and persistence. Um, but I, I guess the, the purpose of the, the greener pastures was we've got these significant challenges to resilience. Um, climate change is happening, as David said. Um, it's going to affect pasture, not just through extremes, temperature, drought, um, but also indirectly through uh, greater insect pests, for example. So, I mean, what, what we tried to do with the greener pastures paper is have a future focus. How would we challenge this? Um, and how do we get resilience in our pastures under a more challenging uh, environment? Um, and the, the trick is also at the same time reducing our, environment, our environmental footprint and uh, meeting what our customers internationally want. Good as go. Nicely done. Thank you. I knew I wouldn't flummox you. Right. Um, I think you've got some, we'll hook into it then. You've got some prepared marks to run through and then we're, we're going to have a few more questions from you before we move on to our next speaker. Uh, thanks, Aaron, and, and thanks to Beef and Lamb New Zealand for their support on this webinar. It's great. 
And um, David Chapman sort of outlined the why of, of the Greener Pasture paper and, and the collation of our thoughts. Um, and I guess our, our concerns facing the future, um, voiced by 240 people at the symposium. Um, and I think it's a good resource to Greener Pasture Papers where it goes to is, is, is the question that David's raised and um, that's one for all of us. The Greener Pastures Papers divide into three parts. I'm gonna cover the first part and the next two speakers are gonna cover the middle and, and, and the final part of, part of it. And I guess my part is the, the value of pasture, setting the scene for the paper. And I guess the first question we sort of had is, is the pastoral industry important to New Zealand? And I can tell you, listening to mainstream media, you might wonder if it is. Um, but the facts um, tell us that the pastoral industry underpins New Zealand's wealth. It covers 40% of the country. It generates more than $30 billion per year in export earnings. It contributes more than 40 cents in every export dollar New Zealand earns. And let me repeat that because it's so remarkable. The pastoral industry contributes more than 40 cents in every dollar New Zealand earns. So without it, New Zealand would be have much fewer cho choices in spending everything from healthcare to supporting those in need. It really does fund the country. But it's more than just wealth. It's part of our iconic culture from Fred Dagg to country calendar. Um, it is part of the New Zealand landscape, um, but more than that, it keeps communities alive and employs one in 10 New Zealanders. But at the symposium, we identified we have significant challenges. Climate change, as David Chapman has said, is already happening and it's gonna affect resilience more. And it's increasing and it's gonna affect all our farm systems from the pastures we grow to the environmental incomes, outcome, sorry. Fresh water quality is declining in some catchments. And uh, there's a number of factors, including that, including our annual nitrogen surplus. The greenhouse Gas footprint for pastoral agriculture is significant. It's around 35 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent per annum. Um, although this is balanced somewhat by our pastures storing about one and a half billion tonnes of carbon in our soils. So we have some challenges and I guess what we're, we're looking at in this paper is confronting these in an, with integrated solutions. And it's about fresh water quality, nutrient management, Greenhouse gas emissions are front and centre, but also animal welfare, uh, making, making a, a larger statement. Profitability is there because our farmers need to have a business to have choices, um, but also our international consumer expectations. I'd say it, the, the, one of the neat things about the, the symposium was how positive people were about the future. Um, I think the big belief was that high value animal protein products from pasture fed cattle and sheep are unique to New Zealand and a great asset to us. They have natural attributes and we're world leaders in producing this efficiently. And we've got a real competitive advantage in our top quality grass fed fiber. The other nice thing was this positive outlook has been shared by the Primary Sector Council. And in the 2019 Ministry of Primary Industries report, which I'll very briefly summarize, uh, they wanted $44 billion more export earnings, significant improvements in freshwater and methane, and 10% more New Zealanders employed in primary industry. Sounds great. Better wealth, better environmental outcomes, more employment. Um, the key question out of the symposium was how do we do it? And I guess the emphatic opinion from the symposium is that we cannot achieve this without a nationally coordinated and directed action. And we have another issue, and, and David Chapman mentioned this, is our R&D and uh, extension resource has been falling steadily. 
it's estimated that public, industry, good and commercial business, RD&E amounts to just 0.23%, i.e. less than a quarter of 1% of our export earnings that the pastoral industry generates. So it's pretty pathetic. So where does this leave us? The first part of the Greener Pastures paper that I'm talking about wraps up with a recommendation. This is one of five recommendations in the paper. To conclude, I'm going to read it out, but before I do, let's summarise. The pastoral industry is important and generates more than 40 cents in every dollar in exports New Zealand earns. It's also an iconic part of our culture, employs one in 10 people. We do have significant challenges and solutions must integrate many things, including fresh water quality, greenhouse gases, profitability and consumer inspections, expectations, sorry. But we believe our high value protein products from pasture fed animals have a great outlook, a view shared by the primary sector council. But and to achieve this, we need a nationally coordinated action supported by RD&E. So to conclude my part of this presentation, here's recommendation one from the paper. We need a clear value proposition to stimulate public and private investment. And this has got to be at a farm, a community, a national level, at all levels, to deliver these resilient pastures that meet our expectations, our goals, environmental, economic, social, and that a collaborative, this collaborative response needs to be facilitated by government departments such as MPI or the Ministry for the Environment. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. So we have got time for a couple of questions. Um, one, just to put to you about, and we're going to come on to a wee bit about um, where we go with this sort of thing, but you've talked a bit about what needs to happen, the aims, et cetera. Tell us your, I guess for want of a better word, your frustrations. You've been in this game for a while longer. Why hasn't it happened? Um, why hasn't it happened? I, I think, uh, Aaron, to me, I think pastures are rather forgotten. Um, and uh, the, the, the funding, the science um, has moved to a short-term basis. Um, a lot of it quite commercial, a lot of the, 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 the and other speakers are going to talk more on this, but um, we're just not really addressing things in a significant way um, to meet the challenge going forward. And in, in an industry that is so valuable and underpinning our economy, it's, it's, I can't understand it. All right. And one of the ways forward identified in the paper and you, you summed up the end that the collaborative response is facilitated by relevant government departments such as MPI and MFE. Um, do they have the, the capability, the wherewithal to do that and and or is there a risk that they'll just decide to do it themselves rather than, than collaborate? We've seen a little bit of that lately. Um, yes, there, there is. And I, I guess any way we do it would, would, would be of an advantage. Um, I think some of the my other speakers are going to cover some of this a little bit more, Aaron, than, than um, maybe I should. But we need to do it, right? We've we've got an industry that's facing real challenges and um, from a range of directions. And, and climate change, at a physical one, is our, our, our main challenge. But the environmental goals, the animal welfare, the consumer needs, the complexity of life, we've got all these things. And if we don't address this we're we're in problems with this industry and um as a country um i don't know what else we do with the 40 percent of land area because there's not a lot of alternative um that's got a lower footprint than than farming um and it's going to take us quite a while to develop different technologies so um yeah i think we've got a real challenge and i hope someone does it and i hope if it's done out of wellington it is done collaboratively collaboratively because um, that model really works. We need farmers to be involved in the model um, because they're the ones who have to implement it and understand it. But we need extension agents uh, helping 
and we need scientists to actually give us the facts. It's, it's, it needs, needs to be done at all levels and that'll work really well. Excellent. Look, I hate to admit it, but I owe you an apology, Graham, because I question whether you get through all your material in the time you had available and lo and behold, you have done it. So well done, congratulations. We will move on and we're gonna keep moving on. Um, please, if you wanna put questions, stick them in the chat, fire them in. We will have some time at the end to come back um, some questions I think are probably best answered by two or three of our speakers, but we will move on now to the next speaker in the lineup. Again, somebody I think most of you on tonight will know well, David Stevens from um, Ag Research. David's got chapter two or part two around innovation. Um, David, this was actually, I was at the symposium and this was one of the things that came up a wee bit that there's an eternal debate. Is it new stuff that's needed? or is it better adoption of stuff we've already got, or is it a bit of both? Where did the, the consensus of the symposium sort of settle down? Is there a gap here in terms of what's been created, or is it about using stuff we've got better? Um, I think, Aaron, is a great question, to be quite honest, because everybody tends to go and lean on what we've already done. But I think when we're talking about this sort of resilience for the future, we're actually facing territory we haven't been in before. And a lot of the solutions are now new solutions. If we talk about microbiomes, et cetera, um, we need to know a lot more about that and we need to accelerate that type of knowledge. If we think that our, some of the few microbiome kind of uh, analyses that we have already, things like uh, rhizobia in legumes, that's, a, that's part of their microbiome, or endophytes in ryegrass, we're talking 40 and 50 years worth of research before we really make significant progress. And we haven't had that investment in the past. So this is about new solutions, it really is. Yeah. So we're, we're um, on a diminishing, we've been riding for a while effectively on sort of investment in the past, is, is that sort of the, the um, A lot of the progress that we made in the 90s and the 2000s through to now, all was built on the back of the lessons that we learned in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Yeah. And we're Sorry. running out. I'm taking a bit of time, but that was what intrigued me about David Chapman's video, the comment about pasture product productivity or production actually uh, stagnating, even for the, the top performing farms, which was a bit of an eye opener. Anyway, enough time. You have a few remarks to, to, to give us before we get into some questions and answers, David, so far away. All righty. Hey, thanks, Aaron. Um, it's great for us to continue this uh, partnership between um, grasslands and beef and lamb. We've, we've uh, had a long partnership in that space, and it's... Um, continues to be quite fruitful. I suppose where I wanted to start was, um, Graham was talking about pastures underpinning our economy. And I want to talk about how science has to underpin our pastures. And, we can, and as Graham said, we can't get away from pastures. Um, we've got a lot of it. It's a very valuable resource and it's a very unique resource. And so we need to figure out how to provide these solutions. and. While we've been concentrating on productivity in the past, uh, that's because that was the need. We had to make sure that our farmers were economic, that they could pay for their children's education and could pay to support their communities. We, we now have a different set of solutions. And again, as Graham mentioned, we've eroded capability to uh, address those. So, so we, for practice change in the future to meet all of those regulatory and consumer-based requirements, we need to have some decent underpinning science. So I suppose the challenge that was brought up is are we resilient now? And as Dave pointed out, um, maybe not. Maybe we are losing our edge in this space. Um, and there are some good reasons for that. But one of the things that we don't know, and as he said, well, we've got evidence in the dairy industry that pasture production is stagnating. And we've got a tiny amount of evidence in the um, sheep and beef industry that that may well also be happening. In fact, we're losing pasture in some spaces, but we don't have a national inventory of our pastures over time. So we're actually a little bit behind the eight ball in terms of being able to um, understand exactly where we are. But of interest, to our um, delegates at the uh, Resilient Pasture Symposium was about what technologies do we need in the future? Um, is it plant and animal genetics? Is it soil microbiology? Is it digital technologies? Is it some sort of widget, gadget or smart tool that we need? And interestingly enough, we covered all of those as we talked about it. 
So and one of the things that was noted quite strongly, for example, in plant species and varieties is that the ones that we might need to deal with climate change are potentially not the ones that are in commercial production today. And, and pretty much because they don't have any real market demand and our science model in that space is so commercially driven, um, then, then we actually aren't able to deliver the appropriate tools to farmers and we certainly won't deliver them fast enough. So, so basically there's a bit of a market failure there because we've been relying on commercial science to deliver the job. And of course, they can't do the job without making money. Um, the physical resilience of our pastures, again, like I say, we, we actually are starting to recognize that we don't know what the issue is. How important are roots in this process? What's the role of the soil and plant microbiome? What's the threat of pastures and weeds and pastures, pests in our, in our landscape? And what are the new emerging pests? They're quite important. We're into a new phase, as Dave uh, pointed out, where nitrogen fertilizer is potentially not our answer. So we need new understanding of, of how our soils uh, react and provide um, nutrients to our plants. And then it's all under new climatic conditions. And I suppose the, the concepts here that I'm talking about, and again, we were talking before Aaron about um, the past and how much research we'd done. Now with a three year funding cycle, the work that we need to do takes decades. So the soil microbiome, for example, or even the rumen microbiome, it's things that could provide us with answers. We need to have spend some serious uh, efforts to make sure that we do reduce our greenhouse gases or capture um, nutrients in the soil appropriately so that they don't leach or keep cover on our hillside so that they don't um, wash into the stream. But out of the symposium, we got some clear messages. And one, one of those is that we need unbiased advice. We need communication between the participants and that's really key. Um, we need to use science to maintain our competitive advantage and that's pastures. One of the things that some of our um, audience strongly uh, recommended was that gene editing and some of the CRISPR technologies, the things that are going to get us ahead, the things that have helped us produce our high energy ryegrass need to be implemented in New Zealand. Uh, we can't actually release our high energy ryegrass in New Zealand because of some of the uh, current thinking around gene editing. We need to understand our resources. We need to share knowledge between farms. We need to avoid data rich and information poor scenarios. So even though our farmers are thinking that they want drones and, and satellite imagery, they, it needs to be delivered as information, not as data. Um, they're talking about the disconnect between pharma and the science and the value of science. And then actually, if we really want science to be the leader in this, that we actually need on-farm champions of those sort of things. Um, and I suppose the final thought was actually the financial systems that we have, the people who provide finance to the farmers actually need to support the need for change on these farms to make sure that they have the wherewithal to be able to make change in a reasonably safe environment. So that's uh, that's a bit of a summary of where we got to, Aaron. Thanks, so, David. Um, do we have any more but, any more questions? Yeah, think? got a couple of questions here, and there may be more come in. We'll have a, a bit of a roundup, a roundtable at the end if there are more come in. But one, um, just digging into that a wee bit. So you've touched on it, David C touched on it about the stagnating, or possibly even in the case of sheep and beef, I think you said declining pasture production. Um, People talk about solutions, but what's the problem? Why is that happening? Um, that's a really big question. Yeah, but we'll, we'll summarize. You've got two minutes. A, a couple of yeah, a couple of moments, shall we? Um, one one is certainly um, the influence of changing climate, and so we are seeing um, more intense uh, rainfall events further apart. That means we lose more of the rainfall into the rivers. 
and it means that some of our more vulnerable slopes, um, particularly our northerly and easterly slopes, um, are actually getting drier, especially in hill country. So that, that's part of the issue. The other part of the issue is that we are using grazing technologies um, and techniques that are potentially 50 years old and developed under different times. And so actually, our farmers are running out of tools with which to manage some of these uh, potential dry spells, if not droughts, um, and still maintaining that resilience of pasture. So there's a, a couple of pointers in there. All right. So just quickly following on from that, um, where to from here in terms of this part of the of the green paper that you're talking about? What's the next step for this one? Well, this is this I suppose is about us revisiting and making sure that uh, what we get is business beyond usual, making sure that we're doing something different. Um, and so one of the one of the outcomes from this um, workshop. Um, was that a national inventory of New Zealand's current forage base, performance trends, insect pests, weeds, diseases, et cetera, actually be created and maintained so that we can track what's happening over time. And as you said, you know, we've got some information that it looks like things are changing, but um, we actually haven't got enough good information on which to then start um, guiding those future innovations and future R&D spend. So that, that's quite critical. And then I suppose the other part to that is making sure that um, MPI and, and other entities, both public and private, start to um, fund things like regional demonstration discovery networks so, so that we can actually start um, addressing these problems at the coalface. It's, I won't call it community science, but it's almost a community science approach where you get the opportunity to link the farmers and the scientists back together to create uh, some new answers for the future. Awesome. Thanks, David. Look, uh, just keeping on time, there's some more questions for you, but we will, we will come back to them. So I'm going to move on and... Yeah, thanks, um, Thanks, David. Somebody else who um, I think anybody around Grasslands knows well, certainly a key part of the organisation on the exec and the executive officer, Marie Casey, from lots of different hats, Marie, but I think PGG Wrightson's the main one you wear. So um, you're going to cover, I think, section three, capability. Um, and again, I'm going to throw you in with a question right at the start. And I, I actually, I think you you know the answer to this one. It was one in the discussion. I don't know if it came from you, but in terms of capability, we've got a pretty clear example already at Massey University. I think we were discussing um, where they're struggling with this whole capability issue. You know the one yes, I'm referring to? You do. Good. Yes, I do. Thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, just to answer Aaron's question, um, Massey have been looking for a professor in pastoral science, something, I think it's a professor, um, somebody that, it, it's an area that, that you know, we proud, pride ourselves on being experts in, and it's a role that they're finding very hard to fill. And that is a that's a huge red flag if we can't fill those positions and yet we tell ourselves we're leading edge in uh, the space. And not just struggling, but two years, I think they've been struggling. That, that's what, you know, I can't confirm, but that's what we've no. heard. I mean, I, there, there's plenty of examples um, in CRIs where they can't fill positions and, you know, the money disappears and the, the capability shrinks. You get less FTEs for your money. Um, okay, so for those of you that only ever see me at Grasslands, um, I've actually been a farm consultant at PGG for over 20 years. Um, so have a pretty strong interest in farm systems, research and behavior change. Um, so I guess that I get to, to be the tail end Charlie and um, I have to thank my all my co-authors, but especially the two speaking today, who have covered off an awful lot of the points I was going to make. So that was good of them, but this will be just reinforcing. So, I mean, at the moment, we all acknowledge that every industry has the challenge of sourcing enough people um, with our low unemployment and levels of immigration, um, but this isn't just limited to New Zealand. But the point is, what does this mean in the context of this discussion around our resilient pastures? 
During the symposium, the farmers kept asking the questions, where is the research? Who's going to assist in the challenges thrown at us? You know, and that's climate change. Um, it's all the things people have mentioned. Dave, in his introduction, highlighted that capability and capacity are critical weaknesses to address. So when the farmers asked these questions, you know, we found ourselves a bit stuck. We didn't really have answers. Um, and having been in the industry, you know, longer than I want to admit, um, from my perspective, I think it's important to consider how do we get here in terms of capability and capacity. Um, looking back and thinking about what has changed in the last 40 years provides some important lessons that may help us to rebuild capability if we choose to take them. There was a pivotal, pivotal, pivotal policy decision around the removal of subsidies, or what we all know as raw genomics, between 1985 and 87, which has had significant impacts on New Zealand agriculture. On the positive side, it's been credited with increasing the innovation and uptake of research and best practice into New Zealand farm systems, um, improved environmental outcomes through reduced stocking rates, uh, improved irrigation and fertilizer use, um, changing marginal land use, i.e. marginal lands reverted to scrub or forestry or conservation land. This is the story we pride ourselves on as, as we you know, became the country that exported on the basis of no subsidies. However, it's not all been positive. Along with, this, along with this was the move that we all recognised to a market or commercial model in science, as well as many other areas such as health and education. What this meant is that once the drivers became commercial, the focus moved strongly to supporting production. Um, and Dave, David Stevens highlighted that, that farmers have had to be productive. Product, productive and profitable. Um, however, this is quite limited um, because that means we support a limited number of pasture cultivars. We support fertilizer use and management and chemical inputs. They're the profitable parts of the system. What's followed is that we've built significant technical capability and it's good capability based on these products. The farmers would question whether it's unbiased capability because they're selling a product and supporting a product. Um, however, we've got to remember that pasture renovation is five to 10% of our agricultural system. And at the same time, we've gradually eroded our capability in the whole farm system that encompasses the remaining 95% of our base, the hill country, the, the, the extensive properties, things like that. Then there's the impact on our science and extension capability and capacity. Prior to 1992 and the formation of the CRIs, New Zealand had a strongly connected science and advisory model. In fact, Aaron and I both sort of came out of that. Scientists and advisors worked closely on the discovery and dissemination of many of the first principles of our pastoral science. This in itself built capability across a wide range of people, including farmers. They were involved. This formed the very strong base we've since used to improve the productivity and profitability of our farm systems. However, where does that leave us now? It leaves us with where we are now, a shrinking pool of agricultural scientists and consultants, no wiggle room, i.e. time and staff, to train people within CRIs or consultancy businesses, a lack of farm systems expertise, which in a perfect world is based on many years of experience as well as expertise. Uh, we're left with a reactive response to any regulation. And an example would be the current proposal for farm planning and audits, which is gonna need lots of people. Are they gonna be farm systems or are they just gonna be environmental ad advisors? Poor or no understanding of farm systems at a pos policy level, which is government or regional council uh, and other places. A recent example we've had down here would be winter grazing and the new rules, um, but it could be something you confront in the environment court or when you're discussing developing policies such as Haywaka Ekanoa. In summary, the human capability across the pastoral sector today presents a roadblock to meet the challenges that we're facing for the next 20 to 50 years. You know, and David's mentioned the timeframe in the research 
realm. We need a lot of people um, to meet the expectation of the growth that um, Graham highlighted, as well as meeting the demands that farmers will face from the regulation changes. Did you have a question for me, Aaron? Oh, you're muted. Jeepers, that's an amateur mistake. Um, okay, um, that's the issue. Um, did the Green Paper, Grasslands, Grassland Trust, the symposium itself talk and think about what we need to do to, to build that capability, how we get those people on the ground with those sort of holistic skills you were talking about? I think, well, at the symposium, it was more limited to the questioning. Um, the conversations we've had since as we built the green paper highlighted um, some of the issues, I think, probably more clearly. And, and it comes down to we needing, needing a discussion on how to build science, science extension and more to meet the needs. But it's not a new conversation. Um, there was a report to MPI in 2014 on future capability of the sector, and it, and it highlights that we need you know, skilled workers, um, those with a degree or higher, and they need to be in critical areas. Um, we can now, after, you know, in 2022, we can now add other skills on farm regulation, farm planning, environment, water, nutrient management, biodiversity, greenhouse gases, social license, and the overall challenge of climate change. So, um, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of capability we need to build. Um, so the next question, sorry, do you have yeah, more on yeah. that one? No. Okay, no. The next question, and I'll make this the last one for now, we'll come back at the end, we have some questions, but yep. um, you mentioned it, I'm a child of the, the sort of mid 80s deregulation, I actually wasn't part of the MAFTEC, the Free Advisory Services Division. I was Ag New Zealand, you know, it was all cut and thrust and yep. um, the market forces. So um, why not leave it to the market to resolve things? You know, David mentioned, David too, David S mentioned that um, we've got to this point on the back of previous research. Now we're seeing a, um, a tapering off. So therefore all of a sudden there's a need being created. We didn't have the need because it had been resolved. So the need's there, the market will resolve it. Why don't we just leave it to the market to sort it? I don't think I don't think the market will support it. Um, I think I think we're resting on our laurels if we think so. Um, we're kind of running out of the the steam that that you know historically we've built that capability. Um, I, I dread to say it, the the old um, you know we're all growing old and the capabilities you know aging out. But it does take significant time to develop a decent level of farm systems understanding. It's not a, you know, it's not a three year degree and into, into a job. So it is, it is, you know, further work, further um, building capability. And I think uh, there's a lot of assumption within government and, and uh, programs, you know, whether it's um, Sustainable Farming Fund or whatever it's called now. And they, that they assume that these rural professionals and science scientists are there to do the job to help assist um, and we've already recognized that market failure has led to a diminishing number of these people so without these people um, we're going to get the type of people that answer regulatory questions we're going to get environmental people that do one job just the same as we got technical people that can do fertilizer awesome all right thanks marie well done. We'll, um, I think you, had, you answered that one well. I've put you on the spot a wee bit there, but we will. <laughs> there's a couple more questions that I think we'll come back to, though. We're going to keep yep. going through our speakers and see how we go for time at the end. So I'll, uh, the king of the Grasslands Association, there he is. He's unmuted his line, Warren King. Again, I don't think he needs um, much introduction, if any at all. Welcome along, Warren. I don't actually have a question to put you on the spot because you've got the enviable or uh, maybe you're just last to put your hand up for a for a role tonight you've got the job of um sort of summing it all up and talking about the the key actions that were recommended as part of the the green paper and knowing you probably anything else you want to talk about tonight too so the floor is yours yeah thanks aaron and um i would have appreciated the opportunity to uh, to not respond to any question you care to ask um, look, but i just wanted to say um right at the outset that the greener pastures discussion paper 
um, is pithy. It's only 13 pages. It, uh, it contains the, the, um, uh, the, the, th the collected condensed thoughts of two symposia held over 10 years, uh, as well as the inputs from, uh, from uh, I mean, the, the authors. And I just want to single out the authors who didn't get airtime tonight, Mike Dodd, Warwick Caddo, and John Caradus, also really critical parts of the development of this document. Um, can I implore you, please, if you haven't already read it, or at least if you haven't read it multiple times, to do so, to read it, to distribute it, to argue about it, to think about it, to email us and tell us we've got it wrong, we've got it right, we've missed a trick. Um, it is a discussion paper and it's designed to stimulate discussion. And, uh, and, and so we welcome that. And in fact, tonight is really, uh, is, is part of that ongoing process for this document to actually, to, to deliver change. Um, my, my role tonight is just to quietly pick up on some of the recommendations that come out of this report, but I'm gonna do it in a way that um, does not follow them in any particular order. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a point I'll, I want to make at the end, and, and those five, the five uh, conclusions, the five main recommendations that come out of that discussion paper uh, kind of lead the way to that anyway. So the first thing I just want to pick up on is something that Graham um, focused on uh, initially, value proposition. Um, while the value proposition is perhaps not widely understood, uh, as, as Graham pointed out, could there be much more at stake? In terms of the, the value of, uh, of production um, from, uh, from these systems, in terms of the, uh, of, of the interaction with the environmental quality uh, of, at, a, at a national scale, could, there, could it be much more important than that? And yet, um, and yet we, we, we struggle to think about it today, and clearly it's only become, uh, going to become more and more important as time goes on. And, uh, and yet we invest no more than 0.23% of its value uh, in, uh, in, in R&D uh, in that system. Um, that's, um, that's appalling. Uh, I, can think of, I can think of no other uh, instance where such a, a low investment would be, uh, would be made in, in such a high value uh, asset. Um, just to follow that up, in fact, um, with uh, something that David Stevens picked, uh, uh, touched on, and, and that's um, knowing the state of the resource. We think we know a lot, I think we do, um, perhaps as an argument to say that we don't know what we don't know, particularly as we go into a, a, to, to climate change and an uncertain future. Um, but again, um, there, are, there are gaps in our knowledge and for such an important resource, um, in no other sphere can I think of a resource that uh, we don't have um, a, a regular and routine assessment of the state and the change of that resource. Um, it really speaks to another point that, um, that both David and Marie have touched on, and that is um, it's about capability and it's about capacity in science. And there are a whole lot of reasons for, uh, for, 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 uh, for them to be some limitations, um, but it could not, again, it could not be more important. These, uh, these pastures that are such a, a critical part of our, of our landscapes and our lives and our livelihoods, uh, science underpins. Uh, the, uh, the the development and the utilization of those pastures, and we are becoming increasingly constrained in that uh, in that realm. Um, there's also an element, again, Marie touched on this. There's a, an element of of the trust in science. Um, you know, two or three years ago, this 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 was a gimme. Um, now maybe not so much, and we need to think really carefully about how we can broker some of these conversations uh, in the light of people who do not have the trust in science that they perhaps used to have. One of the other really key points that comes through in the discussion paper is just how pivotal a role farmers play in uh, in, in the future. Now, obvious, it's, it's an obvious thing, right? It's a it's a, it's a truism uh, that farmers are the key decision makers on the land. But it's also a truism that those decisions impact a far broader range of stakeholders. And there's a really strong argument that that broader range of stakeholders. Um, including other people in the industry, including central and regional government, including uh, the, uh, the, the people who are the neighbours, the inhabitants of, uh, of local and, and regional uh, towns and communities, um, including the end users of the products that come from those systems, all need to be involved in those conversations in some way. Um, mana whenua are a key part of those conversations going forward. Those, those joined up conversations deliver better decisions. These joined up constructs, these better decisions will not happen by accident. 
they will not be delivered out of, uh, out of a focus on specific issues, and they will not be delivered out of three-year science, uh, science project cycles. But what does a sustainable model look like in that realm? And I think the discussion paper actually points towards uh, some, some thinking in that space. Um, they say that a vision without a plan is no more than a dream. And I think that um, this discussion paper is not a plan. Uh, the vision contained therein is partly explicit and wholly implicit in that document. That document contains the elements of a plan, but what's missing is timelines, accountabilities, and investment. Now, we, um, we all collectively and individually have a responsibility here, but there are some key institutions who have the mandate to make some really key changes in this space. And I'm looking uh, particularly, I'm talking about um, MPI and about MB and about MFE. They alone have the mandate to make some really significant changes here. Now, that's not to say that everyone else on this call gets off the hook. We don't. We need to stand ready to participate, to assist. Um, we have a, have a key role in having formal and informal conversations in this space to undertake advocacy where we can. And look, our votes matter. How we vote matters. The conversations we have in public, they matter. Um, but it is particularly MPI and MB, as say an MFE, central government, regional government to a degree as well, who have some critical roles to play here. Again, a vision without a plan is just a dream. My nightmare is that in 10 years time, we're sitting here having the same bloody conversations again. That, that would be um, a, a complete travesty and a total disaster. Now we keep doing the same things over and over and over again, expecting things to change, right? That's insane. Something has to change and that change has to come from us. So I implore you, read the document and make a change. Um, and I'm particularly looking at, uh, at the, the people who have influence in, in central government to make some really significant changes to change the conversation. But it's, it's actually really incumbent on all of us individually to think about what changes we can make to facilitate uh, what needs to happen in this industry for us not to be back here in five years or 10 years time having the same conversation. This speaks to legacy. What's the legacy of the Resilient Pastures Symposium? What's the legacy of the people who are sitting inside, particularly sitting inside MPI, MB, MFE? Um, what do they want to be able to look back upon and, and, uh, and say, we made a change and this made a difference. We can't afford to be back here having the same conversation next year, let alone in a decade. So my message to you all is make a change and make it tomorrow. Thank you, Aaron. Oh, you're a facilitator's dream, Warren. Don't need to draw you out and, and, and leave your people wondering what you're thinking. Don't mute your line because I've got some questions for you. You're verging into Michael Jackson territory there a wee bit at the moment with the make the change stuff. But it's a good point because I was making some notes as I went through here and specifically the actions we could take at the end were, um, and I think you touched on their visionary rather than necessarily too specific. What's the next step for... Uh, New Zealand Grassland Association and New Zealand Grasslands Trust, you're the authors of this paper. I'm using you collectively. You're the speaker representing them at the moment. What To turn that into the action you talk about to influence those people, what are uh, the two organisations going to do next? Uh, you're asking me specifically. I think this is a question that could go to all of the speakers. In fact, yeah. all of the authors of this paper. In fact, probably everyone on this call um, would have, a, have an answer for you. But from an NCGA um, perspective, specifically, and I'm, I'm taking a bit of liberty here because um, um, you know, Laurie's the current president and, and, um, that's, that's, uh, and I'm not, um, but it's NZGA's role is to, uh, is to facilitate these kind of conversations, is to provide, um, I mean, you, you can see through the, the conferences we hold at the symposia we organize through the publications that we, uh, that we make, that we are trying to um, stimulate and facilitate exactly these conversations. Now, are they, uh, are they appropriately joined up? Um, we can certainly have a conversation around that. Do we have enough uh, presence in Wellington? We absolutely need to have a conversation around that. Uh, but, we, um, but we have a, um, 
it is our mandate to stimulate, uh, to facilitate these conversations. And again, tonight is an example of that. And we'll continue to seek out opportunities to get this message across to the people who are in a position to actually make significant changes going forward. Thanks, Warren. So look, Laurie is on there. I don't know whether Laurie is both president of Grasslands Association and also a farmer wants to add anything. Laurie, you can have a think about that. But just while I'm on, any of the rest of the speakers tonight want to add anything to the answer to that question about where to from here, what the, the call to action is, what Grasslands Association, Grasslands Trust and its members do from here? Marie. I could say no. <laughs> <laughs> You've unmuted um, your line, so. <laughs> I think um, Warren's right. It is it, it is on everybody. Um, we, as as an association, we we strive to get the science out there. Our key role is to to get the science out there. Um, I could talk forever about how hard that is to get the science in to get it out. <laughs> Again, the capability question comes up. There aren't the people, there aren't the reviewers, that you know, um, people are busy, they've finished their work, they move on. So um, that has been our role and, and we will continue to do that. And we and I guess we're using the technology more now, um, things like this webinar, YouTube videos to, to widen that social media, just to widen that push. Um, Yes, because people need to find the science. And if they find it, they'll read it. So that's our role, simply. Thanks, Marie. All right, David and Graham, whether you had anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, I can add a little to it, Aaron. I mean, we, we have the um, New Zealand Grassland Trust, which is, sits alongside the Grassland Association, um, mostly comprised of ex presidents, a uh, place where presidents go to. Um, express their real opinions. No, um, but the point is that that uh, that network does provide again provides the the personal touch to uh, when we did the Hill Country Symposium, for example, we had Gavin Sheath who was able to to go and talk to people in Wellington and and be able to um, provide them with an appropriate uh, conversation about what we're trying to do uh, to to make sure that we get. The conversation started, uh, and in and in this, for instance, um, we've already um, using those connections to make sure that some of our science organisations um, are very aware of of what where we think the direction should go. So, again, trying to put appropriate um, topics on the table and and uh, generate some um, go forward on some of these issues. I mean, it's it's kind of important to note, for example, that if you go onto some of our, even on the beef and lamb website, there's a lot about animal production, but there's relatively little about pasture management. And, and we, we, we have taken it as a given and we, and we need to continue to get that message out, which is where Marie's coming from in terms of saying we have a huge resource there, which can add to this, uh, to this debate and, and inform uh, some of the things we need to do for the future. Thanks, David. Graham, I, don't, I see Laurie's unmuted his line, so I'm going to go to him shortly. But Graham, did you have anything you wanted to add as well? Um, yeah, it's it's always difficult. I, I think uh, David's been right. The Hill Country Symposium, we had a position paper and, and it did make an influence on Wellington. Our hope is that this does. Um, it's very hard to talk to MPI or MB uh, because are they listening or does it fit their agenda and um you know you hope to to have ripples and an effect and we hope some good will come out of parts of this um yeah how optimistic are people it's a good question look i'm um laurie you've unmuted the line did you want to um say a few words no no just a message came up all right no, we were just, they, were, they mentioned your name a couple of times, Laurie, but as um, president and as a, a farmer, whether you want to add anything. Um, we are a bit over planned starting time. I've just got a couple of questions. Um, if you have to go, um, feel free to sign off. As I say, we're recording this and we will stick it up, but I'm just going to 
wrap up with the last couple of questions. One that actually came in in chat from Ron. I'm not sure who that is, but thank you, Ron. Um, and I don't know which of our speakers want to answer it, but the question is, rather than look to government to change, how can we leverage farmers' needs for resilient pastures into increased farmer investment, including through their levies, such as Dairy NZ and Beef and Lamb New Zealand, I guess, in the core science and extension that will take New Zealand Ag to the next level? Who'd like to address that one? Can I start, please? Please Sarah? do. Um, I'll have a go it's, after it's, you, Dave. it's a great thought. It's a great thought that uh, farmers would want to step forward and put their hands up. Um, but to give you a for instance in this space, this is just this is just to give you some background. Um, Beef and Lamb New Zealand uh, invest what four or five million dollars a year in research and development. Aaron sounds about um, right. Our commercial seed companies invest how much, Graham? From from memory, I think that PGG Rights and Seeds invest something like twenty million dollars a year. So, yep. and and in that, for instance, they are still working on endophyte ryegrass and white clover. Now, if you want other um, cultivars or you want other species addressed, that's a very very significant amount of money. And and well, I I applaud the effort to suggest that the farmers would like to step forward, a lot of the issues that we have and the problems that we're trying to solve are national issues, which is why we turn to the national government to at least lead the charge and lead the coordination. We're not leaving any of our, um, our industry partners out of this conversation. That is really, really key. It has to be a, a full and combined um, conversation when we are trying to create answers for the problems that we have. Thank you. Thank you, David. Warren. On the principle that um, having great ideas is contingent upon having a lot of ideas, 90% of which will be rubbish, some of those even might stimulate some thinking. I had a dream. And uh, and in the, in the way that uh, that uh, you just talked about before, Dave, actually, um, with, uh, with Beef and Lamb New Zealand uh, using the, uh, and leveraging effectively, Farm or levy money uh, in the uh, in, in the meat space. Dairy NZ, of course, relying on uh, on uh, on, a, on a milk levy to do the same thing. We all know that the loss of the wool levy was completely bloody um, short sighted and, and bonkers. Um, why don't we have a grass levy for every blade of grass that's eaten? A fraction of, of a fraction of, of of a cent then goes into a pool specifically for uh, for um, research and development in in, uh, uh, in this kind of almost in, in the pre-competitive space in, in pastures. Now, um, for one thing, it, uh, it it enables rather more than 0.23%, hopefully, uh, to be invested in what is a critical resource. And for another thing, it signals to central government that farmers themselves recognize that this investment is critical. Now, it'll never fly, will it? The EID might be the issue there, Warren. Um, thank you very much. I don't know whether anybody else wanted to answer that question. I've got one more question before we wrap up. If I could just just add to um, coming from a commercial perspective and just uh, agree with David Stevens. And um, we, we know the numbers of the industry, perennial ryegrass are about 4,200, 4,500 tonnes sold a year of printing ryegrass. We're completely preoccupied with it. Um, Coxfoot's risen dramatically to almost 250 tonnes. Um, so compared to 4,500, I mean, we actually spend too much time breeding Coxfoot for the small size of the market, and our program is too big in Coxfoot. So that's the commercial model. And that's the issue that we've got with some of these things that are beyond the commercial. They're strategic and, and it's about the wealth of New Zealand. And um, I think we as citizens get it. Um, it's just, I don't know what happens when you get to Wellington. It's different, different atmosphere or something, or maybe there's something else in the air anyway. Thanks, Graham. Bring back Wana, I say. We've still got a bloody demonstration paddock of that on our farm. I think so on 40 odd years ago. Bloody stuff, you can't kill it. Um, last question, and this is again, I think, one for the panel as a whole. So there's that concept we talked about um, big, gnarly problems, need sorts of solutions. But one of the keys, I think, that's always underpinned this in New Zealand agriculture has been that saying, none of us are as smart as all of us. It's been that collaborative effort from um, 
blue skies thinking to um literally out under blue skies farming so how do we get that connection between science and application uh, between research and farmers how do we get that back build it water it grow it when we've been told that farmers feel that it's died it's withered it's fallen apart you're muted david if you're trying to talk marie you are muted first I did unmute first. Um, I think that's where my point around looking at our history, where we came from when we had connected science and extension, the universities were part of it. Um, and I think we need to look at that model more closely. We need to build people that work together right from the start. Um, and that builds the trust back into science. Um, I think that you know, we've got the current CRI review is underway at the moment. There is a space where they could have a conversation. Um, farmers at the symposium highlighted that they wanted regional research stations. Um, so these are old thoughts, but they did work. Thanks, Marie. David? Yeah, I just want to follow that because that's really important. Um, my background is, is starting work in a regional research station. And uh, that actually provides you with a huge connection um, with farmers and their needs. And we have lost all of that with the retrenchment of science. And, and if you think about, um, we used to have over a thousand scientists and technicians working just in ag research alone. And we're now down to about 350. So how do we then connect with our rural communities if we don't have the resource to do it. And as Marie said, the, the, the CRI restructure is the ideal opportunity to start redressing some of these issues in the first instance. Thanks, David. And last chance, I don't know, Warren or Graham, you wanna add anything to that one? I'll just add and, and reiterate what Marie and David had said. I've been involved in some fantastic extension and change programs on around regional research stations, the Linky University Dairy Farm. Um, Pukawa's had a fantastic thing at the moment. Taranaki Dairy uh, uh, Demo Farms are, are, are doing some great thing and attracting engagement. And all of the success has been due to farmers driving what's happening and asking the questions and involving their communities to get along and having good measurement and quantification and science to actually tell you what's going on and help explain things. And, and so it's that engagement with farmers through regional, through farmers driving. And, and um, it's the only time I've really seen any significant change in those models. I've been around a few years as well. Thanks, Graham. And once again, he's going to have the last word, Warren. Really? Oh, my privilege. Uh, look, these, uh, these ideas are really, really good examples of properly joined up conversations and the ability to facilitate uh, those conversations in sustainable ways. Maybe there are other examples. I'm sure there will be other examples as well, but it's just such an important part of, uh, of the of the way that this industry will need to uh, cooperate and to collaborate uh, as we as we face these um, these increasing pressures. So uh, who's who's going to who's going to who's going to pull that lever, and and how do we um, how do we involve them in the conversation and involve ourselves in that conversation as well? That's that's kind of it's an open ended question. There are lots of lots of potential answers to this, but as I as I made the point right at the start, this discussion paper is just that. So it's really important that this conversation continues. Brilliant, thank you, Warren. And all I can add personally to that is we certainly need more people trained to bloody well facilitate webinars for Grasslands Association, let me say that for nothing. Um, but on that note, we will call it to a close. Thank you very much to, to all of you who've joined us tonight and stuck with us a wee bit longer than we, we thought we might've gone, but I think um, the discussion has been well worth it. Thank you to Marie. Uh, to David, to Warren King, uh, to Graham, and to David Chapman, who couldn't be with us, but recorded uh, uh, his video for being with us, and the other authors of the paper, and I should have had it in front of me so I can remember, but um, 
we've put the link there in the chat. We'll put the uh, paper in the blurb of this video as well, so you can find it as well. And last, but certainly not my uh, least, I just want to say thank you very much to Lucy Murray, who um, you haven't seen tonight, but she's been running the whole uh, software behind the scenes for us to make sure it works smoothly. The registrations got out to you and everybody got joined and uh, running the recording. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, we will hear from you soon. Good night.